So we're going to uh, turn to our first panel, then we'll take a coffee break and come back and have a discussion um, up here on the panel and with the audience. Um, and following that, we have um, Acting Deputy U.S. Trade Representative uh, Wendy Cutler speaking for lunch. <clears throat> um, joining me on the panel are some veterans of this conference, um, well-known um, academics, policy advisors, and, uh, and uh, diplomats, uh, in effect, for their countries on Asia-Pacific economic integration. Um, first, we'll hear from Dr. Zhang Jiangping, Director of the Department of International Economic Cooperation at the Institute for International Economic Research at the National Development and Reform Commission. Um, Dr. Zhang is uh, uh, on call all across the Asia-Pacific region to comment on APEC, RCEP, and various um, international uh, trade and financial agreements in the region. Um, his degree is quite interesting. Um, I'm going to have to find it because I uh, want to know if he still does this. Um, landscape ecology, <laughs> which is fascinating, and of course economics uh, for his PhD. Um, and then we'll hear from uh, Professor uh, Shujiro Urata from the Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies at Waseda. Urata Sensei is also involved in um, multilateral uh, and, uh, and Japanese economic uh, research. He's on the Japan Center for Economic Research at Nikkei Shimbun and a senior advisor to the um, Economic Research Institute for Asia area. And then uh, finally from Singapore, Professor Hank Lim, a senior research fellow for the Singapore Institute of International Affairs, um, a professor at National University of Singapore and the chair of the Academic Advisory Board for area, this um, multilateral economic, economic uh, research uh, group that's been established in Asia. So we'll hear from each of the speakers uh, on their perspectives on developments in Asia-Pacific economic integration, and then I'll call on my friend and colleague Matthew Goodman to give some comments, and then we'll take a break and come back and try to sort it all out with you in a discussion. So let me first ask Dr. Zhang to start us off. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Green. Uh, actually, I hope today China's economy can, like your surname's color, becomes greener and greener. <laughs> That's our top mission. Uh, <clears throat> I will, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, both uh, CSIS <clears throat> as well as uh, 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 JETRA uh, invited me uh, for this conference. Uh, also, th this, this is the second time for me to come here. Uh, <clears throat> it's my great pleasure and honor. Uh, also, uh, here, uh, I will uh, introduce very briefly uh, regarding the new stage of Asia-Pacific economic integration. Uh, all of you know that uh, this year, <coughs> APEC uh, annual uh, conference uh, will be happened in China uh, in this autumn. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, this year also, I studied uh, Asia-Pacific economic issues uh, uh, <clears throat> I will introduce uh, uh, three parts. The first one is uh, a foundation of uh, uh, FTAP becomes uh, more solid. And the second point is uh, FTAP. Uh, that's one goal and one dream uh, of all economies in the region. The third one is uh, three layers of Asia-Pacific economic integration. Uh, that's, that's my personal uh, idea. Uh, Regarding the foundation of FTAP, uh, you know that this is a not new idea. Uh, a few years ago, Australia and other economies in the region already proposed FTAP. The problem is that uh, in the past, there was no TPP, you know, uh, 12 members. Uh, at, at that time, there was a very small uh, P4 and P8, something like that. Uh, at that time, we have no, you know, uh, so a lot of important bilateral and trilateral uh, free trade negotiation. Today, uh, we are very happy to see that uh, new finished uh, bilateral negotiations that Japan, Australia, ROK, Australia, as well as Canada, ROK. Uh, meanwhile, China, ROK, China, Australia, it seems that this year or next year, there will be result. Uh, meanwhile, China, Japan are okay, uh, already on the track of negotiation. 
Uh, another very important thing, fact is that uh, TPP already finished more than 80% you know, contents negotiation. Uh, RCEP also have four rounds of negotiation. Uh, you know that uh, based on two tracks, based on so a lot of bilateral and trilateral free trade agreements, based on, you know, there is a new information sharing mechanism uh, that's new start point on promoting and coordinating for RTA and uh, trade and uh, investment uh, liberalization and facilitation in the region. So I think that uh, that's a very good foundation for FTAP. Uh, actually, uh, this time for Chinese side, we just uh, have a proposal of uh, FTAP uh, feasibility study instead of FTAP uh, negotiation. Uh, you know that uh, uh, actually <clears throat> uh, I already uh, talking about uh, compared with the past proposal. Uh, today, FTAP becomes uh, more tangible and more practical, more feasible. Uh, meanwhile, uh, look at uh, you know, uh, free trade agreement, uh, uh, those uh, bilateral and trilateral free trade agreement effect, that uh, frag uh, fragmentation effect in the region, as well as uh, spaghetti bow effect. So I think that uh, it's right time for us to promote uh, FTAP. Also, you know that uh, in Qingdao uh, last May, uh, in this May, actually all, most of economies in the region already agreed to study on the roadmap uh, of NAFTAP. Uh, of course, you know that there are some of uncertainties of uh, uh, bilateral and trilateral RTA uh, will be you know, the problems uh, for uh, FTAP. Uh, the second point regarding uh, FTAP, uh, I personally, I think that's our you know, medium and long-term goal, and also that's belonging to our uh, one dream. Uh, I think that uh, if you look at the uh, possible approaches, uh, there, there would be you know, maybe more different uh, scenarios. Uh, maybe one scenario is that uh, from TPP to uh, FTAP. And the second scenario would be maybe from RCEP to NAFTAP, uh, FTAP. And the third one may be both on the basis of, you know, FTA, TPP and RCEP. On the two, the two track in the near future, maybe they could be, uh, become uh, convergence. And then, you know, that's formulated FTAP, uh, blah, blah. So, I'm afraid that uh, now for all economies in the region, it's time for us to study on the possible you know, roadmap and the possible uh, scenarios. Uh, I think that uh, all economies in the region should have open mind for multi approaches to FTAP. Uh, today, we can find that uh, TPP has a very obvious uh, progress. On the other hand, we can find a lot of conflicts uh, between uh, developed economies uh, and developing economies in, uh, within uh, TPP negotiators. Uh, even if uh, within developed economies, uh, between Japan and the US, you also have uh, you know, tough missions uh, to be re need to be re resolved. Uh, resolved. Uh, of course, uh, you know that regarding rules for late commerce, uh, such as China and ROK, uh, at the end of last year, uh, Goodman, uh, he, is, he is sitting here, and uh, you know, Professor Tan from Singapore, they have uh, uh, you know, uh, different viewpoints uh, on, the, on that rule. Uh, for example, United States said that uh, uh, for China, if you want to join TPP negotiation, you have to negotiate with every member. But uh, Professor Tan said that uh, in case that uh, China wants to join, okay, you can join. Uh, no problem. So this type of things, uh, you know, how to deal with in the future, uh, that's, that's the issue. Uh, of course, uh, you know that regarding China's attitude uh, changes on TPP. Uh, last May here, uh, I, talking about, uh, I was talking about, uh, you know, uh, six type of misunderstanding made by Chinese scholars. Uh, today, I'm very <coughs> happy, uh, you know, that uh, uh, actually after I present here, at the end of the last May, uh, the 
a spokeswoman from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, China, uh, says that, said that uh, TPP 10 plus 3 as well as 10 plus 6, all of them would be possible approaches for promoting Asia-Pacific economic integration. And then a uh, spokesman from uh, MOFCOM China said that uh, China will seriously study and follow TPP progress and study on the possibility, feasibilities uh, of joining TPP. So I think this is a very objective and uh, very positive attitude uh, on TPP. Uh, this year, Premier Li Keqiang in Bo Luntan also says that uh, China will be happy to see TPP members uh, make consensus. I think uh, this type of attitude shows that uh, between China and the US and in Asia Pacific region, actually, I think that uh, between China and the US, we should have a new model of uh, you know, China-US relationship. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we also hope that, uh, you know, on one hand, China will, will not oppose, will not against the TPP. On the other hand, we also hope the U.S. can support RCEP negotiation. So that will promote Asia-Pacific economic integration. Uh, last point regarding three layers of Asia-Pacific economic integration. Uh, I think that uh, trade and uh, investment liberalization and facilitation, that's the top layer and uh, relying on rules and regulation constructing in the region. And the global value chain and Asia Pacific production network, uh, that's the middle layer and belonging to supportive role, uh, can play supporting role. And the thir third layer that is the communication and the connectivity. Uh, that's the bottom layer, and very fundamental roles will be played by, uh, by uh, this one. Uh, if you're talking about uh, trade and investment liberalization and facilitation from Bogogo to today's FTA, FTAP, you can find that uh, that's the main goal of APEC. Uh, meanwhile, you know that you can find that uh, uh, today APEC uh, is going from facilitation action plan also to liberalization of trade and investment. Uh, especially if you look at environmental product list, if you look at information sharing mechanism, also maybe next one will be IT product treaty. You can find that uh, today APEC is gradually from you know, non-binding uh, mechanism to both you know, non-binding mechanism plus binding uh, mechanism. I think this is a very big progress. Uh, of course, I think that FTAP, TPP, RCEP, all of them should be complementary to WTO. And uh, I also very happy to hear that uh, United States government uh, spokeswoman says that uh, uh, TPP and RCEP sh uh, is a complementary relationship instead of a competitive. Uh, the next one is, uh, some of scholars said that RCEP and the TPP maybe will build in block towards WTO. I don't think so. I, I think that, uh, you know, that uh, TPP, RCEP just uh, cover, you know, uh, maybe 10, 20, uh, almost 20 economies. But you can find that uh, w, WTO rules are covering, you know, more than 160 economic uh, in the world. Uh, Global value chain, you know, that uh, this year is very, very appreciated by APEC meeting. And we hope that uh, this type of uh, activities can promote Asia Pacific production network. Uh, actually, Apple is uh, a very good case for uh, GVC. Uh, China, you know, that today China has a very big transferring trade surplus from Japan, from ROK due to, you know, uh, uh, East Asia uh, production uh, network. Uh, that's why we need to reform, you know, global trade statistic uh, system uh, in order to uh, truly reflect China's uh, trade surplus against the U.S. According to my institute uh, study, we found that uh, between, if you look at China's trade surplus <coughs> against the U.S., more than 36 
of China's trade surplus actually belonging to that type of transfer, transferring uh, trade surplus. Uh, that means uh, uh, the trade surplus scale between China and the US is not so big, yeah, uh, as uh, statistics showed. Uh, but uh, I have to conf confess that uh, China's development is benefiting from uh, East uh, Asia production network. Uh, today, China has already, already gradually become the, uh, one of the biggest uh, outward investors in the world. China's outward investment is booming. So I think that uh, it's right time uh, to promote, uh, you know, from East Asia production network to Asia Pacific production uh, network. In that process, a lot of, uh, you know, developing economies in Asia Pacific region uh, they will have opportunities to be involved in global supply chain and to get precious uh, development uh, opportunities. Uh, so this, this uh, figure shows that uh, in, uh, by deepening uh, specialization and uh, uh, stretching uh, industry chain cooperation in Asia Pacific region, actually we can extend the space and the field of industry cooperation actually we can create cross-industry and long-chain tracing uh, from agriculture to manufacturing and from manufacturing to service sectors. And uh, we, uh, that means all economies in the region can obtain the long-term and sustainable development uh, opportunities, uh, reduce trade conflicts, uh, achieve the diver diversification of uh, export uh, uh, market. So I think th this kind of activity should be promoted by all economies in the region. Uh, this case shows that uh, in East Asia production network and industrial specialization, you can find that uh, uh, Japan, Philippines, uh, Singapore, they have their different advantages uh, in regional you know, production chains. As well as China, we, of course, we are good at assemble. <laughs> <clears throat> but I think that this type of model can promote, uh, you know, regional economic cooperation and the regional uh, integration. Very few words on the new round of China's reform and opening up. Uh, in China, a demographic dividend will be disappeared uh, in the next uh, five to ten years. And it's very urgent uh, for China to promote uh, innovation-oriented economic model. Uh, meanwhile, pre-national treatment and negative list for both foreign investors as well as private investors already have a pilot project in Shanghai. Uh, meanwhile, uh, BIT negotiation between China and the US, uh, between China and the uh, EU, and uh, governmental procurement agreement negotiation between China and the EU uh, in progress. Uh, you know that uh, Today, China actually to, uh, already de determined to be the practical and constructive promoter uh, uh, on trade and investment uh, liberalization and uh, facilitation. Uh, we will promote uh, Asia Pacific production network uh, construction, as well as we will uh, uh, try to set up China's uh, free trade agreement uh, network uh, in Asia Pacific region, as well as in uh, global society. Lastly, uh, regarding uh, communication and the connectivity, uh, both for hardware and uh, software, uh, both for uh, you know people to people uh, communication, uh, as well as uh, infrastructure to infrastructure. I think that in the region uh, there are so huge demand, but uh, lack of enough fund. Uh, for example, for Indonesia, only one country, their infrastructure fund demand uh, will be about uh, 160 billion US dollar. Uh, but you know that Asian Development Bank can only provide 110 billion, uh, 100 billion US dollars, their Asian infrastructure fund. That means we have to uh, explore other possible you know, fund uh, in order to support uh, infrastructure connectivity in the region. Uh, so uh, very briefly, as I like to say that in case that we can combine three different layers and then maybe we will have our comprehensive
framework to promote regional economic integration. So that's my uh, viewpoints. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. While I'm waiting for my slides to uh, appear, uh, I'd like to uh, make a few observations. Uh, what I'd like to do is to first discuss uh, regional uh, uh, arrangements, uh, FDA, uh, TPP, and RCEP. Uh, I don't know, am I supposed to do something? Are your slides ready? Will? Sorry. This one? This one. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, yes, so uh, I'd like to do th two things. First, to discuss uh, mega FTAs in Asia Pacific, and then uh, turn to the uh, uh, issue of Japan's F FTA strategy. Uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, I'm trying to avoid the overlaps, so let me go directly to brief comparisons uh, between uh, TPP and RCEP. Uh, Although there are uh, many areas uh, which uh, uh, overlap, but uh, in my view, there are several important differences. Uh, one is the, uh, the level of comprehensiveness. Uh, TPP more comprehensive uh, compared to RCEP, and also the level of trade and FDI, foreign direct investment liberalization. Uh, uh, again, uh, 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 TPP is more uh, my so-called high-level uh, liberalization. Although uh, we don't know yet because uh, uh, they are, uh, both of them are under negotiation. And then another difference uh, is the treatment of developing countries. Uh, according to the information that I have, TPP does not provide so-called special and differential treatment to developing countries, whereas uh, RCEP uh, uh, puts a lot of uh, important emphasis on special and differential treatment. Uh, this, the reason is quite obvious. Uh, RCEP has uh, several developing countries, especially uh, so-called CLM, uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, and also India. Uh, they are, uh, well, compared to other countries, uh, lower level of economic development. So they cannot really maybe accept some of the conditions which uh, can be accepted by uh, more developed countries. Uh, so th that's, uh, these are some of the big differences, and recognizing these differences, uh, I think, uh, well, as I agree with uh, Dr. Jan and uh, Ishige-san too, uh, uh, they are and they should be complementary rather than conflicting. Uh, having said that, I look at uh, the uh, these two frameworks somewhat differently than Dr. Jan or maybe uh, Ishige-san. Uh, I think they are quite different and they will stay different and they will coexist. This is just my view, okay? And I call this uh, uh, stages approach to regional economic, in economic integration in Asia Pacific. That is, uh, for developing countries, uh, they can participate in RCEP uh, but they cannot participate in TPP from the, uh, from the start. But while they grow economically, uh, being a part of RCEP, uh, they may be able to become uh, a country which can accept the conditions which are imposed by TPP. So first step, RCEP, and then second step, TPP. And then, in my view, TPP will be, uh, uh, in, in, you know, will become uh, FTAP. And hopefully, FTAP, with maybe like uh, TTIP and Japan EU, uh, will become a f uh, kind of basis for next generation of WTO, uh, which deals not only uh, border issues, but uh, uh, behind the border issues. So, this is how I look at the uh, possible future developments of regional economic integration in Asia. Again, stages approach to economic development, uh, uh, stage approach to regional economic integration. Now, uh, let me turn quickly to Japan's FTA strategy. Uh, first, uh, uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, Japan can benefit from 
uh, uh, participating in many FDA strategies, including, of course, TPP, RCEP, uh, and, of course, that, I guess, comment can be made for other countries as well, including the United States. Uh, and let me uh, look at the, uh, let's see, uh, FDA performance, so to speak, of Japan. Uh, this uh, looks at the, uh, this is called FDA coverage ratio. Uh, this ratio shows the proportion of trade that Japan has with FDA countries to Japan's total trade. Uh, uh, and this is for Japan, this is like uh, less than 20%. Compared to the U.S. Uh, at the moment is, uh, I guess, 40 percent, and China is about the size of Japan. But compared to other countries like Chile, Mexico, uh, Japan is by far uh, much, uh, you know, lower rate. In other words, Japan, maybe along with China and the U.S., has a huge potential to be gained by expanding its uh, FDA network. Uh, Another uh, indicator that I look at is called FDA trade liberalization ratio. This shows a percentage of uh, 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 tariff lines uh, committed to be uh, eliminated uh, in total number of tariff lines. Uh, for Japan, uh, in the case of Japan Philippines FDA, uh, Japan committed to liberalize 88.4% of tariff lines, uh, so less than 90%. Uh, whereas uh, uh, U.S., uh, U.S., say Peru, or say Australia, U.S., FTA, uh, this 99% may be a bit higher than what it is. I, I, got, I, I saw some what, lower number, like 97%, but still, you know, uh, much higher than what Japan has achieved. Uh, and, of course, the higher, uh, the better uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, its impacts on economic growth. Uh, and it is uh, very obvious why Japan has a very low liberalization ratio uh, because of uh, difficulty in liberalizing agriculture. And uh, th this uh, diagram shows uh, the uh, tariff rate for a selected number of agriculture products which receive very high uh, heavy protection uh, beginning with cognac limo and rice, uh, peanuts, and so on. But I have to say, on average, uh, agriculture protection uh, given to you know Jap Japan, that is average uh, agriculture pro product, uh, protection ratio, which is not so bad compared to countries such as you know other agriculture importing countries like Korea, Norway, Switzerland. But again, the uh, special feature of Japanese agriculture protection is the heavy protection given to a uh, few selected uh, uh, products. Um, but of course, that makes it very difficult for uh, government to uh, uh, liberalize or to, uh, 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 to accept the high, uh, liberal, high uh, trade, liberalization, uh, trade liberalization ratio for Japan's FTA. Uh, but uh, these are some of the numbers which come from so-called simulation uh, exercise. Uh, and the uh, question is, of course, what would happen to Japan's GDP if Japan uh, uh, participates in TPP and RCEP? Uh, the numbers uh, vary depending on assumptions, uh, depending on a model that they use. Uh, Japan's cabinet office uh, comes up with this 0.66% uh, uh, growth of GDP from TPP, 10, 12 uh, country TPP, uh, which is uh, uh, much lower than other figures. And one reason is that the, this Japan's, Japan's cabinet office number only uh, uh, deals with uh, trade liberalization, and not, not on uh, liberalization FDI on others. So, uh, Naturally, the number is uh, much smaller than others. Uh, Peter Petri, Plama, and Fanzai, uh, they did uh, produce these numbers for uh, 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 their study. There, uh, Japan can expect 2.0% increase in GDP by participating in TPP 
and 1.8% from RCEP and 4.3% from FTAP. Um, uh, Dr. Kawasaki from Japan came up with an uh, even larger number. So uh, the point is, though, uh, we can expect positive impacts from uh, uh, FTA participation. Uh, yeah, I, I just, let's see, before, and I, I just like to make uh, this last point which uh, I, I have at the, at the bottom of the uh, slide. We talk about the benefits of uh, FTA, you know, because you can expect expansion of exports to FTA trading uh, partners, but uh, all these uh, simulations show us the biggest benefit come from opening up of your own market. So th that, I think, is a very important point, especially from economists like me. I'd like to emphasize that. You open up your, your market, you sign up for FTA for your own sake. You know? So that, that, this is a very important point. Uh, and now, but again, uh, it is rather difficult to open up everything for Japan because of the higher agriculture protection. And some of the arguments that the agriculture, agriculture protectionists make uh, are shown there. They say uh, Japan's uh, self-sufficiency in food supply is already low. It will be even lower if we open up uh, our agriculture market. Uh, opening up agriculture market has a negative impact on environment and so on. Some of these points uh, can be justified, but I have to say, protection uh, is not the first best policy, uh, for example, to uh, deal with the environment. The first best policy is to, say, give subsidy to some uh, uh, maybe environmentally friendly uh, activities. Or so. Uh, Agriculture protection is not the first best policy. Even some of the argument they make uh, may be justified. And uh, I'd like to make two other points uh, on agriculture. Uh, there is an interesting study which tries to estimate the cost of protection to consumers by protecting so-called five sacred agriculture products. Uh, their estimate is $240 per person. Uh, like $1,000 per family. And this is a quite a big money, uh, especially when we know uh, nominal income of Japanese, average Japanese declining. Uh, and there's a discussion, uh, when we, it is, when we uh, have a discussions on raising consumption tax, there's a discussion of exempting uh, a tax on food because, uh, uh, because t you know, to uh, 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 deal with uh, possible regressive effects of such income, such tax on the poor. But if we remove protection, we don't need to discuss this kind of exemption of uh, food uh, items from taxes because we'll get the same effect. So again, uh, liberalizing uh, agriculture protection will benefit the poor and the maybe old. Uh, uh, and finally, uh, removing protection will give benefits to ambitious farmers. We talk about exporting of agriculture goods. That is very important. One effective way of promoting uh, export of agriculture, pro protect agriculture product is to remove protection of agriculture. Because uh, with protection, uh, you look at domestic market which is prof profitable, but with that protection, you have to look outside, uh, foreign market, and that will lead to increasing export. Okay, uh, just a few concluding remarks. Um, well, Abenomics uh, seems to be working, in my view, uh, although uh, they have uh, only two uh, arrows shot. Uh, first arrow is uh, uh, aggressive monetary policy, and the second arrow is a f flexible fiscal policy, and we are waiting for the third arrow, growth strategy, to be shot. And uh, important components of a uh, uh, growth strategy is uh, FDA, and particularly TPP. And uh, with uh, uh, growth strategy, I, I, uh, I hope uh, Japan can 
uh, get back on so-called growth trajectory so that uh, future uh, prospects of the Japanese economy will be more optimistic. But to do so, uh, we need to open up. And uh, in my view, there are ways to deal with this possibly negatively affected uh, sector. Provide safety net is one way to do it. Another way is the gradual liberalization. So there are ways to deal with possible negative impacts. And uh, I, there, I'd like to you know, kind of discuss with uh, US uh, uh, participants, uh, say concerning your experiences in TAA, like the trade uh, adjustment, adjustment uh, 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 assistance uh, uh, program. That seems to be very interesting, but we don't have that. Again, uh, let me emphasize that uh, the point, the uh, argument that I made is for Japan, but the same argument can be made for other countries, including US. So I'd like to see market opening, uh, not by Japan only, but by the US and maybe China, so that uh, all countries can benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you, <coughs> Michael. Uh, after the big powers in Asia, China, Japan, so it's the supposed to be Michael Goodman uh, supposed to speak on for the United States. So the three invited panelists are supposed from Singapore and to speak on the perspective from Southeast Asia. Now, uh, Southeast Asia is often, especially in, the, in Washington, uh, D.C. area here, is below the radar, not very much, uh, because flying very low. But nonetheless, I think I would like to mention the importance of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the 10 nations, in the context of the regional integration in the Asia Pacific. Well, first of all, we have to know about the status and uh, update on the ASEAN Economic Community, the AEC. <coughs> the AEC blueprint to be completed by 2015, so in, uh, a year and a half to go, it is estimated to be completed about 80% on average. Uh, the good sector is almost 100%, while the service sectors and investment sector will be much lower. ASEAN 6, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Brunei, and the Philippines would have highest cost of completion compared to ASEAN 4, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam. Now, on this, uh, the, uh, there are two types of scorecards, they call it, uh, how much the percentage uh, of completion of the ASEAN economic communities. Uh, officially, there is one from the ASEAN Secretariat, and unofficially, but requested by the ASEAN Economic Minister, the area, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, which is based in Jakarta, has a very more comprehensive. So for those of you who would like to compare and all these things, uh, uh, you can look at the area website, area.org. So uh, these are the uh, details of it. So, uh, I'm not going to go to details of it because we are running our, running behind time. We're supposed to have a, a break by now. So I just go through the main things and emphasize the uh, 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 issues that are providing insights and issues that may have big policy implications with respect to the role of U.S. and Japan, and for that matter, China. One of the objectives of AEC is a single market and production base, and this also is often <clears throat> misquoted and not clearly understood, the interpretations to it. So I think this is the, however it is best viewed not as a regional integration per se, 
but as a coordinated and concerted domestic reform initiated among ASEAN member states in order to make the countries and the region more attractive investment destination, a more competitive production base, a more robust and equitable economic region that is connected to the global marketplace. So this is uh, uh, very important to understand that it is not, it sounds like economic community associated with European community, but it's not. Uh, sounds also like uh, uh, trade negotiation. It's also not trade negotiation. It is a concerted, coordinated efforts among the 10 ASEAN member states to accelerate <coughs> and coordinate the domestic reforms. So it means trade negotiation, trade politics, and trade policies is not that critical. By end of 2015, the AEC would have achieved a single production base, particularly on the 13 priority integration sectors, PIS such as agro-based, air, air transport, automobiles, electronics, e-ASEAN, ICT, information communication technologies, fisheries, healthcare, logistics, rubber base, textile and apparel, tourism, food base, and healthcare sectors. So for American companies, and uh, for Japanese, Chinese, and all these things, so the PIS uh, uh, sectors are particularly of great interest because these are the first line of defense where opportunities abound. The AC may not achieve a single market, but would have a significant progress, 80 to 90%, in implementing liberalization, facilitation, equally important, and connectivities among the 10 ASEAN member states. So ASEAN economic communi communities has three elements, liberalization, facilitation, and connectivities because of the uh, divergence, different stages of growth, but also because of the geographical proximities among the 10 member states. Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership what is it seen from the uh, Southeast Asian or ASEAN perspective? Our RCEP negotiators have not progressed much after the fourth round of negotiation. The fifth round will be this month in Singapore on the 23rd of June, this, just a week to go. Uh, the RCEP negotiators have agreed to establish uh, working groups on trade in goods, trade in services, investment, economic, and technical cooperation, and working group on competition and intellectual properties. So, uh, so the first, sec first round, second round, th third round, and last one in Nanning, China, basically the trade negotiating committees and uh, working groups, exchanging notes and uh, discussing uh, those issues. So it's not properly in a negotiating stage. RCEP negotiators have also agreed to set up a working group on sanitary and phytosanitary SPS measures and standards, technical regulations and conformation assessment procedures for discussion at the fifth round of RCEP negotiators on 23rd June in Singapore. ASEAN centrality is an important concept in RCEP. However, so far, ASEAN has not provided the substantive initiative initiative in RCEP negotiation, except as the facilitator of the process. So this is a very important point. So in the sense, as a driver, you have to not only provide the facilitation, the environment, the structure, but it's also you must provide initiative for the substantive discussion to it. But so far, RCEP is only on, uh, on the uh, meeting, uh, the first, second, and third and fourth is only just the uh, trade negotiating committees and uh, 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 four working groups. And now they will additional the on intellectual properties and competition working group. That will be the first time to be discussed in the Singapore uh, next week. It could be it could be necessary at the at this juncture for non ASEAN members to champion or to drive the RCEP negotiating process as scheduled based on the principle and objectives for negotiating RCEP. 
officially adopted by ASEAN Trade Minister in Simrip, Cambodia in August 2012. Perhaps Australia and New Zealand, with the support of China, Japan and Korea, could initiate some important breakthrough in negotiating forward on rules of origin, co-equal co rules, trade facilitation, service liberalization and non-tariff barriers. So these are the identified issues that have to be given prime priorities. The completion of RCEP as originally scheduled end of 2015, coinciding with the completion of AEC, is crucial for the full economic benefits of regional economic integration in East Asia. So in a sense that for uh, Asia-Pacific integration, the AEC is priority number one. And RCEP is divided. Uh, um, some um, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei are members of the uh, TPP negotiators. But I think uh, RCEP <coughs> also uh, um, uh, very important, the ASEAN, plus ten, ASEAN 10 plus the ASEAN 6 the China, uh, uh, Korea, Japan, India, Australia, and New Zealand. Trans-Pacific Partnership. <clears throat> At the latest TPP round of negotiation in Singapore in February 2014, the meeting was unsuccessful to secure a draft consensus deal which was supposed to be ready by April 2014 before the, uh, during the visit of President Obama to Japan. The difference over market access tariff on imported goods as well as common trading standard over a range of issues, including labor regulation and environmental protection, prevented negotiators to reach a draft consensus agreement. It is therefore not likely to reach an uh, overall draft agreement to 2014. But as the previous speaker as well as a congressman uh, has pointed out, I think the issue is boiled down Japan and US and also all the um, trade uh, uh, TPA, uh, Trade uh, Promotion Author uh, Act, uh, uh, which is uh, very much uh, important in, in completing as well as in uh, negotiating the uh, TPP. Lately, China has seen a different perspective on TPP. Its position has shifted from being cautious to positive as it begins to recognize TPP economic importance and potential as a driver for its domestic structural reform. And this is also has been emphasized by previous speaker. If the US can base its TPP approach as it did when China was applying to become the WTO member, then perhaps there would be more receptive response from China. This again, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, chairman Isege Sun also has indicated about this uh, 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 development. TPP without China membership is one form or another is considered by many Southeast Asia uh, as unrealistic and confrontational in regional integration approach. A special and differential treatment for developing negotiating countries should be considered with respect to time of implementation but not on the level of standards and qualities. That again, Ezekiel San mentioned it's that the time is the essence, in addition to the substance and the, in the negotiating process. Summary and conclusion, the AC would be on schedule to be completed by 2015, not in full to some ASEAN member states, and mainly in the good sectors, in the Atiga they mentioned, some service sectors and in the investment sectors. ASEP has yet to decide on the modality of negotiation, whether it is based on negative lease approach or positive lease approach. And this will be discussed next week in the Singapore in the, on the fifth round of the ASEP uh, negotiation. After the fourth round, ASEP negotiations have, have not gone much beyond setting up working groups. The concept of ASEAN centrality has worked in taking the initiative but not in driving the substance of RCEP negotiation. So something, somehow, the game, change, the game has to be uh, uh, initiated and championed by non-ASEAN members. The, TTP, the TPP negotiation have failed so far to reach a draft consensus agreement to complete 
the negotiation into Zero 14. And this very much depends on the, the two sides, Japan and the United States. Dynamic and internal domestic environment on the U.S. and external environment in the region have complicated the process in reaching a consensus on draft agreement in TPP negotiation. That against the uh, congressman uh, uh, has <coughs> eluded the process of this uh, Trade Promotion Act as well as the uh, elections, coming elections, and the initiative that the president is required on the United States part and Japan, Prime Minister Abe. A more flexible, gradual, pragmatic approach are required. So there exists an opportunity for China participation in the TPP negotiation. The, U the U.S. should take note of this emerging opportunity and challenge. So because in the past, uh, TPP uh, was considered as a pivot point of the U.S. in a way to balance the rise of China. So now it has dramatic change on the Chinese side. So certain um, uh, initiative on the U.S. side should be, should be taken. Having a more flexible approach in TPP, negotiation could provide a pathway for a parallel and converging process of TPP and RCEP in the region. I mean flexible approach in a sense that uh, you don't have to uh, compromise on the principle, but in negotiating, you can skirt around and navigate. For example, in the uh, negotiations of the US-Singapore FTA, as you know, chewing gum cannot be imported to Singapore. But somehow, a very clever negotiator said, for medical use, for medical use, for uh, health reason and all these things. So it saves the negotiation. So it's accepted. You can import chew gum if it is considered for health purposes. For example, also another very creative way and on this uh, state procurement, government procurements. Uh, now in the TPP with Malaysia, for example, it is uh, unless you prepare to change the constitutions or Malaysian constitution, it is not it's not, it's not uh, doable. But you can skirt around it, probably on uh, uh, defense, on uh, uh, um, uh, securities issues and all these things, government procurements may be for Malaysia because it has a Bumiputra policies. So somehow you can be creative and negotiate in such a way that you can conclude TPP. I personally think it should be done should be on a timely basis, and probably by mid next year, TPP should be completed. Okay? Uh, I think this is the, the, the main things of my presentation. Thank you.